Hello, my name is Eva and I run the account Notation is Great on Twitter. So today I'm going to talk about German lute tablature and this video follows from two other videos, one on Italian and one on French lute tablature. So these are the three types of lute tablatures that we find in the Renaissance. So just to recap a bit, if you've seen my other videos, maybe you can skip this part. What is a tablature and how is it different from staff notation, which is what we are used to these days? Well, a tablature is more of a set of instructions, okay? So there are tablatures for different instruments like the organ, the viol, the violin, etc. And I tried to cover a few of those in other videos. But basically with staff notation, you don't have typically any indication on how, how to produce a given pitch, a given note. You are told, well, this is a G major chord, just produce it. Uh, whereas a tablature gives you some kind of instructions. So for example, if you remember my videos on French and Italian lute tablature, it tells you which frets you need to operate in order to produce that sound. So while Italian and French lute tablature share some similarities, German lute tablature is quite different in that each fret is given its own sign, its own identity. So let's have a look at this representation, which comes from Matthäus Weiser's lute tablature. So Weiser was one of the main composers, lute composers of the German Renaissance. So we have a lute here. So let's forget about the string to the left for a while, which does its own thing. So if we start on the second string, we have the first fret. On the first fret, we have an A. Then we jump to the third string, we have a B on the first fret, then a C, then a D, then an E. And then we go back to the second string, second fret, F, G, H, etc. When we get to the end of the alphabet, so if you look at the fifth fret, we have a Z. Then we have a 9, okay, and then the alphabet starts again, but this time we have a line on top of each of the letters. And at the bottom of the image we have one, two, three, four, five, so the numbers of the strings, and this means to play an open string. Okay, so the last thing you need to know is that string to the left, so it seems to follow a different system. Well, this was because German lute tablature was originally designed for five string lutes, so when lutes developed to have a six string, then they needed to somehow fit this in. So the decision that Weiser has made here is to give that six string capital letters. This is a piece by Weisel. And as you can see at the top, we have the stems and flags that indicate note values. Okay, so this is the same as in French and Italian tablature. But unlike French and Italian tablature, we don't have lines, we don't have a so-called staff. But basically we have each of the signs for each of the frets piled up. So the highest one will be at the top, the lowest one will be at the bottom. But basically you need to know what each of these signs represent. So you could, for example, figure out, do a sort of table uh, and pair each of the signs with each of the notes. Bear in mind though that sometimes on the lute you can play the same note in two different ways. So for example, as an open string and as uh, a number of frets in, the, in another string. So basically this tablature not only gives you the pitches that you need to play, but also how you need to produce them. So as with many examples of some of the earlier notations, German lute tablature is not always standardized. So you can have slightly different systems coexisting in different manuscripts. And this is an example of this. So this comes from Musica Getuscht und Angesogen, which was a treatise by Sebastian Fiertung. And Fiertung in this book basically explains a number of different instruments that were in use at the time, like the organ, the recorder, and so on. And he also gives us examples of the different notation systems used for these instruments, okay? So here he's explaining lute tablature to us. So as you can see, it follows the same principle as we saw in Weisel. And again, the sixth string does its own thing, you know, uses different symbols. But as you can see here, when he gets to the end of the alphabet, instead of starting again and writing a line on top of each note, basically what he does is to repeat the letter. So it goes from A to AA, 
BB, etc. So this is all you need to know to read German literature, and I personally find it more difficult than French or Italian, but you just need to figure out what each of these signs mean. So I hope you've learned something from this video, and if you have, I would like to invite you to consider making a donation to one or more funds or charities supporting musicians affected by COVID-19. We have a couple of links here. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.